Good afternoon. Uh, we apologize for the slight delay, but uh, we needed to bring in more chairs, so that's always a good, a good thing. Uh, my name is Geneviève Zubzitsky. I'm the William H. Sewell Jr. Collegiate Professor of Sociology. That's a mouthful. Uh, and I'm also director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. Um, in one month exactly, today is uh, January 24th, so in one month exactly, it will be two years uh, since the Russian Federation's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. But the war uh, predates 2022 by several years, and the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia has been paying close attention to Ukrainian affairs uh, for a very long time. The scope and intensity of the war uh, since February 24th, 2022, has, however, moved us to develop several important initiatives focused on Ukraine. By far the most important was the creation of a fellowship to bring six Ukrainian scholars and their families to Ann Arbor in August 2022, just a few, I mean, several weeks uh, after uh, the invasion. Uh, Two of them were able to return to Kyiv last fall, and uh, we were truly relieved to be able to offer a second year of fellowship to the four fellows who could not return to Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. We're really glad to have them with us um, in the room tonight. These fellows are teaching this year at, at the University of Michigan. They're teaching on Ukrainian architecture, hybrid warfare, disinformation, and the history of genocides in Ukraine. Their presence here in Ann Arbor and in the classroom uh, at the University at, at U of M provide a unique opportunity to our students to learn about the causes and the consequences of war. We've also had um, or created opportunities for Ukrainian students to come to U of M, and our first one is arriving in a couple weeks. So a postdoctoral or doctoral student actually coming uh, to U of M to do some research this winter. And of course, we organize lectures uh, with experts, art exhibits, and films. And as February will be the Ukrainian month at WCEE, I want to tell you a little bit about those special events. So we will screen two Ukrainian films on the war at the Michigan Theater. They are free and open to the public. And both will have the directors of those films in attendance for a Q&A after the screening. The first one is 20 Days in Mariupol. Yesterday, it was uh, selected, nominated for the best Oscar, uh, the, the Oscar for best documentary film. Uh, and the other is Life to the Limit. Um, and that is also a documentary film uh, shot by actually a soldier of the war, someone who has served in the Ukrainian army on the Eastern Front since 2014. Uh, and he will be in, the, um, in attendance as well. Um, then on February 19th, we will have the WCEE Distinguished Lecture by Yulia Mendel, who's a Ukrainian journalist and President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky's press secretary from 2019 to 2021. Yulia, who's here tonight, um, is the 2023 24 distinguished, wiser, uh, distinguished fellow, and she's also a Knight Wallace fellow. Um, the lecture will be at the Rackham uh, Amphitheater, so we really hope that you mark all of those events, except for tonight, they're all on Mondays, so February 5th, 12th, and 19th. So before introducing our speaker, I'd like to express our gratitude to our colleagues and co-sponsors uh, at the Ford School for Public Policy and welcome special guests, uh, the Honorable Eileen Weiser, uh, who's here tonight. Thank you, Eileen. Um, and I think Ambassador Susan Page, who's director of the Weiser Center for Diplomacy, uh, might be late, but we welcome her in advance of her arrival. Thank you so much for being, us, being with us today. Um, it means a lot. So now to our guests. Uh, Pablo Kuchta is Ukraine's former acting minister of economic development, trade, and agriculture. And he's currently um, uh, advisor to Ukraine's deputy prime minister of reconstruction. 
Since last April, he has served as an advisor to Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister of Reconstruction, and in that role, he assists in structuring reconstruction policies to maximize their economic impact and actively attract uh, investors to support Ukraine's recovery. He previously served as Ukraine's Acting Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture from 2019 to 2020, where he oversaw public sector enterprises and the ministry's operational management. He also launched a large privatization program during that time. He worked as Chief Policy Officer at the Kiev School of Economics from 2020 to 2022, where he coordinated uh, that school's economic policy projects and led uh, KSE, the, the Kiev School of Economics, uh, communication efforts with policymakers, the media, and the general public. Prior to that, uh, Pablo Kukta served as advisor to the Prime Minister in the Strategic Advisory Group for Support of Ukraine Reforms. And in that capacity, he helped define the economic reforms agenda and priorities for the Prime Minister and Cabinet of Ministers, including in the spheres of energy policy and corporate governance. So we have someone with us tonight who knows a lot um, and who can tell us actually the challenges of the war, but the challenges also for reconstruction, what, what lies ahead uh, for Ukraine and what it all means for Europe. Um, the war in Ukraine is very important for uh, the EU, from, for Europe as a continent, and also for us in North America and the world. So we're uh, extremely uh, pleased and honored to have Pablo Kuchta tonight to speak about Ukraine's political, economic landscape and its place in Europe. Uh, please join me in offering Pablo Kuchta a very warm Michigan welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Genevieve, that was Awesome. I was kind of thinking, uh, am I being heard? Do you hear me well? Good, thank you. I was thinking how to introduce myself and then Genevieve read out my CV. So. <laughs> I guess I don't need to do that anymore. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I will try, I, I was thinking how to structure this to Ukraine, what to tell. And especially since this kind of opens the whole season advisor center dedicated to Ukraine. So I think it's appropriate to, for it to be, you know, introductory in a way that it tells a story. I will try not to dive too much into details. I will try not to bore you with, I know, non-essential economic detail or some political, historical stuff, but to kind of tell you the story of what it's about. This war going on in Ukraine, Russian attack on Ukraine, Ukraine itself, why is it important? What's the broader context? Why should you even care? Right? So it's a country in Eastern Europe. Why is it important to you here in the U.S.? So we will try to talk about that. I'm sure I will miss a lot of stuff because the topic is so broad that it's impossible to really tell it in all details. So then we will have a Q&A for about 40, 45 minutes where you will be able to ask me anything and I will try to reply to the best of my abilities and knowledge. Thank you. Let's start. So does this work? I don't think it does. One more time. It will work. It will work. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, it does now. Thank you. So, Ukraine, what it is. Uh, it's a nation of currently about 33 to 37 million people. And you'll probably ask me why. What's with the number? Don't you know how many people are there? Well, that's the latest estimate by the UN and the IMF on how many people are actually left within the borders. And the discrepancy is approximately the amount of people who are right now uh, refugees, mostly in the EU. So also, this number excludes the people who are in the occupied territories. That's four to maybe six million people more who live in Crimea, in Donbas, in the areas captured and occupied by the Russians. Uh, that's the size of Poland. That's actually exactly the... I'm sorry. Jesus, I'll turn... I wonder why I've turned the sound off and it still sounds. Anyway. Yeah, I guess so. I'm sorry for this. 
Uh, anyway, that's the, the size of Poland. Poland is 37 million people. So it's essentially another Poland right near it. Uh, Poland is here, by the way. Its GDP is 160 billion. And to give you a perspective, that's about six or seven towns like Ann Arbor in the US. So Ukraine is quite poor. Now, Ann Arbor is, of course, a university town. So it, its GDP is much larger than what would be normal for an American town of a size of 100,000 people. But still, it's a small town of 100,000 people. And imagine that a country of almost 40 million has GDP of six or seven such American towns. So it either tells you how relatively poor Ukraine is or how rich US is. Uh, anyway, by territory, Ukraine is the third largest in Europe after Russia and France. So it's a big country. It's a, a relatively big Eastern European country with, let's say, an outsized importance in world affairs now. So and let's get to that now. The basic history of it is essentially like this. Uh, Kiev, my native town, the capital of Ukraine, is kind of the place where civilization spread from in the whole area. So everything east of Poland, it, it, it kind of came from Kiev. Russia came from Kiev, Belarus, so all, all those nations around it came from there. Uh, it actually, Ukraine shares more time in its history with Poland and Lithuania than with Russia which many people confuse. So especially before the war, before people got more informed on Ukraine, people were thinking like, ah, it's Russia. It's not Russia. It actually is, it was longer part of Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth than it was under Russian uh, occupation. Because essentially Russia, when Russia started carving up its Eastern European neighbors, it kind of started with Ukraine then continued with Poland and Lithuania. So and since uh, from 18th to 20th century, Ukraine was part of Russian Empire. Then when that empire collapsed, uh, it became part of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's national, you know, the nationalist movement, uh, nationalism, the formation of modern nations, reached Eastern Europe uh, in 19th century. So it started in 18th century in Western Europe and kind of moved uh, to the East. And that's when Ukrainian national identity started to be formed at exactly the same time that Russian national identity were forming. So again, they are quite contemporary. The two great poets who formed the respective languages, Ukrainian and Russian, Taras Shevchenko in Ukraine and Alexander Pushkin in Russia, lived in exactly the same time. So literally, the two nations are, they, they don't, it's not like Ukrainians sprang up from Russians or something like that. They actually formed out of the ethnic space of Eastern Europe at exactly the same time. They're contemporaries, these nations. And a little later than the Poles, actually, from whom we both borrow, because that's, that's how nationalist ideas came from Western Europe to the East, through Poland. Now, uh, in the 20th century, Ukraine, together with Poland, together with Belarus, together with Western Russia, was a place of bloodbath. I mean, that, that's the only way you can call it. Timothy Snyder, the famous American historian, called this area Bloodlands. So that's essentially where Soviets and the Nazis were conducting most of their crimes and where they fought each other during World War II. Millions died, and this has had a terrible legacy till now in the minds of people, in, in, in how people, you know, in the mindset, how people view life. Uh, Ukraine had a brief first period of independence when the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, could not hold to it, so was recaptured by the Bolsheviks, but it was uh, impressive enough for Lenin to recognize that, okay, Ukrainians are a separate nation, whether he likes it or not. So he had to recognize Ukraine, and that's why Ukraine was a separate republic within the Soviet Union. So the Bolsheviks recognized that they have to live with Ukrainians being a separate identity and not Russians, uh, which is funny now because Putin is now alluding that Lenin somehow created Ukrainians that way. Uh, anyway, uh, Ukraine gained its independence in 1991, a couple of years later than uh, its Eastern European neighbors uh, went out of communism. So the transition from communism to modern free society started at approximately the same period. And funnily enough, uh, the level of development of these societies was about the same. So the GDP per capita in Ukraine, in Poland, in Slovakia, 
was about the same when we all exited from communism. And then this happened. So this is Ukraine, right? And this is Poland and Slovakia. So somehow the three countries went out of communism, started doing reforms, started the transition to market economies, and those of them who went to the EU, those of them who were a bit to the West, went up like this and were great success stories, and Ukraine was not. Why? Now, this will be a bit complicated, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, there is a um, measure which the World Bank calculates. It's called Worldwide Governance Indicators, which kind of measures the level of institutional development of different nations on different scales. Here I'm presenting four. It's the rule of law. It's voice and accountability, essentially freedom of speech and democracy. It's the effectiveness of government, and it's the control of corruption. So again, left is Ukraine, right is Poland and Slovakia. You can see the discrepancy, right? So it seems like we started together, but in fact, somehow, our neighbors had an institutional advantage. They were more developed in terms of their institutions, though not their economy, I'm sorry, not their economy because Communism was kind of a great equalizer. Everyone was equally poor. Why? Why did this happen? Why, why this difference in stories? Well, this is, um, I'm sorry, this is a generic picture of a border wall. I wasn't able to find the real one, but I'll tell you what it represents. And uh, I'll tell you a story about it. Uh, when uh, an American prosecutor Bogdan Vitvitsky of Ukrainian origin came to Ukraine several years ago to help reform our prosecution. We kind of had to talk to him. I worked as an advisor to prime minister back then. And since he was coming to Ukraine, he, he's, very, he's an old man. He first came to Ukraine right after it got independence, so immediately after that. And here he told me vividly what he saw there. So what was the, how did Ukraine look at the start when, uh, when it first opened? And he told me a story of a border wall between Ukraine and Slovakia, its eastern communist neighbors. So two communist countries, essentially both controlled by the Soviet Union, both satellites to the Soviet Union, separated by a border wall approximately like this. Why? Why, why was Ukraine so isolated? Then he told me how uh, Ukraine's airport in the capital in Kiev under Soviet rule, had about like two flights per day, something like that, one of them to Moscow. Why? Well, because Ukraine was kept close, really close, really artificially close. If you're looking for a place that the Soviet, the Moscow authorities were trying to keep isolated from the rest of the world, even within the Soviet Union, that's what Ukraine was. That's what was happening there. And even with other communist states, so imagine that, like, the, both satellites to Moscow, but it decides to put this wall between them. So and I, I think this wall, unfortunately, symbolizes the root cause of these problems. So what happened was it created a mindset gap, this, this closeness, the, this artificial attempt by Moscow to keep Ukraine isolated from anything it could isolate it from. Uh, this has a long history. I mean, Ukraine was trying to get independence. Ukraine was fighting. Uh, Ukrainians were resisting on a multiple level in the Soviet Union, including within the Soviet apparatus itself. So even the Ukrainian communists were kind of constantly trying to push Moscow for more independence for Ukraine within the confines of the Soviet system. And uh, this backfired by Moscow pushing back. And essentially, at some point, First of all, they killed millions in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, then there was a brief period of a warm-up, so-called, in the Soviet Union, where kind of things became a bit more liberal, well, for a communist system anyway. And then uh, they tightened the screws, and they tightened the screws in Ukraine probably more than anywhere else. And this really drove the intellectuals out, so you couldn't really make a career there. Just to give you an example, one of the first computers and one of the first neural networks, artificial neural networks, was actually built simultaneously with the US. So the first one was built in the US and the one in 
the Soviet Union was the second. It was built in Kiev. It was built in Ukraine. So cybernet, Soviet computer science originated in Ukraine. And it was gone by in several decades. And so were other, other areas of knowledge. Because the authorities clamped down and drove the intellectuals out. They did, you, you couldn't really work properly in the country. Anyway, so that, this, this, this produced this mindset gap. This not enough knowledge, not enough understanding of how to construct a proper free and well-developed society out of what we had after communism, much less than what the Poles knew, the Slovaks knew, other nations knew. And this produced weak market reforms. So Ukraine tra Ukraine's transition was much less successful than what was happening to the west of our borders. We were not as good at reforming our economy, at transitioning to the market economy, at you know, using all the instruments that started coming into our hands to develop ourselves, to break out of this mold that we were cast into under communist rule. What this produced was a distorted economy where uh, you could, you, you have big problems running a business, but you have no problems doing corruption, stealing, embezzling, you know, playing game in the system. And uh, unfortunately, this created this uh, Systemic corruption that Ukraine is sometimes notoriously known for. So when you hear the news, some and other corruption scandals in Ukraine, oligarchs, you know, all that stuff that we have to contend with in our reputation, that's where it comes from. So the unreformed economy produced opportunities for corruption, which produced oligarchy and systemic corruption. And then these forces start fighting and stopping the country from doing reforms, and this kind of creates a vicious circle which was one factor leading to, to this, right? To this divergence. The second factor leading to it was, of course, our neighbor, Russia, right? So, uh, first of all, very direct. They were simply trying to keep Ukraine from integrating with the West as much as possible. Keep Ukraine from the EU, keep Ukraine from NATO, keep Ukraine even from the World Trade Organization, anything they could. Second, uh, Corruption, you know, corruption, <laughs> let's say the root cause of corruption in Eastern Europe has sometimes been called the Russian gas trade, right? Because that's where the big money are, and that's where the dirty money always were. It was even called in the 1990s uh, the business of presidents. That's how people called it. So, uh, I mean, most Ukrainian oligarchs, most Ukrainian oligarchic groups actually come kind of originate from that, from dirty money made with Russian gas. And that was the second factor contributing to the system. So Russian pressure, corruption and oligarchy, and result, unlike Poland, which we are very similar to, Ukraine was not integrated into NATO, not integrated to the EU, not really developed economically, and kind of stayed in a weakened state in this gray zone, right, between the Western world, the EU, the NATO, and Russia. And until what I would call the age of revolution hit. So in 2014, a corrupt pro-Russian president, Yanukovych, won a big dictator, really. He was trying to essentially monopolize power in the country. Uh, he was toppled by a popular revolution, so-called Maidan revolution, or revolution of dignity. That's, uh, that's the picture. Maidan is the central square in Kyiv. So to the right is the picture during the revolution. To the left is like what it normally looks like. So, and you can, you know, if you come to Kyiv, you, you can just walk here and see all this. It's a, essentially a living, living history right now. So anyway, Yanukovych was toppled. He was uh, kind of Putin's crony. And this happened less than two years after Russian's own moment of, well, failed revolution, unfortunately. They had protests in 2012. I don't know how many of you know this. Uh, but these protests really scared the Russian regime. So it's after them that Russia decidedly turned totally authoritarian. It's after them that the laws were introduced, for example, banning any kind of protest. Uh, if you've seen news from Russia now, they, kind of, they have these 
single person protest. So one person is allowed to come out with some holding something, and that is allowed, though even not anymore. They even arrest these people now. But you cannot gather in groups. That's prohibited. That was prohibited after 2012. So uh, uh, imagine this. Less than two years after something that threatened Putin, uh, in a neighboring country, very closed, his crony is driven out by a revolution against exactly the same system that he constructed in Russia. And, um, well, can we, can, can, we, can we push, please? It's a video there. I think it should play. Yeah. <laughs> Now, what is this? This is a hockey stadium in Moscow on the 27th February of 2014, six days after the revolution in Ukraine. These are Russian hockey fans. They are shouting Slava Ukraine. I'm pretty sure many of you have heard that. Uh, so glory to Ukraine, a slogan of Ukrainian revolution and now a slogan of Ukrainian army. Uh, so these are not Ukrainians. In fact, these are people who, m many of whom probably are now fighting against Ukraine. But back then, in 2014, six days after the revolution, they were chanting this at Moscow, right at the seat of Putin's regime. Why? Because apparently they took note of the example. And personally, I'm pretty sure this scared Putin to shit. <laughs> Right? Because I, I remember this vividly, and then I specifically looked up this video to show it to you, because I remember this moment, and many people missed it, I think. Now, I'll have a bit of an interlude here. So there are currently two theories on what Russia is. And it has very practical implications, because these theories guide us into, OK, what we should do about this. One says that it's just a corrupt authoritarian regime that managed to kind of capture its nation, take it under control, uh, because it had oil, because it had like the Soviet traditions, but ultimately that nation wants to be free and democratic. And ultimately, one day this regime will be toppled, probably by a revolution, and then Russia may rejoin, kind of integrate with its democratic neighbors to the West. That's one theory. There is another theory. It says that Russia is essentially kind of fundamentally a 500-year-old machine for concentrating resources under one will, built by the czars many centuries ago and fundamentally unchanged since then. Whatever it's modernizing is superficial. That's the other theory. And then that the revolution is never going to happen, right? It's never going to join the democratic world. You can only try to contain this thing, right? Try to keep it within its borders, try to somehow work with it, but it's not gonna change. These are the two theories. So, and uh, I mean, they have real world implications. Okay, what do we do about Russia now? Do we try to force regime change, try to help the forces inside bring down Putin, or do we have to simply contain him because no one's gonna bring him down? Well, I think both theories are kind of true, and this thing at least, proves that maybe there is some hope for change there. Because, again, these are not friends of Ukraine. These are these hockey fans, probably many of them went, they are Russian nationalists most, probably many of them then went to fight against Ukraine. But 10 years ago, when the revolution happened, they were chanting Slava Ukraine. Anyway, on the same day, February 27, when they were chanting this, Russia attacked. Crimea, Crimean parliament was occupied, and that was the start of the annexation of Crimea. Then, what, two months later, they invaded Donbass. I mean, we can drop the pretense now for eight years we were talking like pro-Russian forces. Those were Russian paramilitaries, obviously, run from Moscow. And that's when the war started. So it's been going on for 10 years, de facto. It's not, it didn't start on February. Uh, February 24, 2022. So, still, uh, this war 
was contained in 2014. So it was contained in the East. There was some vicious fighting, and then the front line kind of stabilized, and essentially it became a frozen conflict. And Ukraine, most of Ukraine lived peacefully for, uh, what, two election cycles. So we've had two parliamentary, two presidential elections, worldwide recognized as free, democratic, normal, we have stabilized the economy. So after years of mismanagement by Putin's cronies, uh, finally we've kind of stabilized our debt situation, public finance, and we've even achieved a stable growth trajectory. We've tried to do reforms to correct the problem of divergence with our neighbors to the West, uh, with mixed results, frankly speaking. So, but we've tried. Some were quite successful, actually. So the, our Electronic procurement, for example, is kind of being copied now by other countries. Uh, the way we did deregulation, I personally helped Moldovan government a year ago to introduce the same system. So it, it, it also is kind of internationally copied. But other reforms didn't work. Overall, I can't say we changed the system so much that it became of new quality. We're, we were kind of midway there. So we, we lived our life. We tried to do the best we could, and then, can you turn the video on? Uh, I think I can, yeah. It was unprovoked, but this is what Russian President Vladimir Putin unleashed on Ukraine. As the sun came up this morning, a missile striking an industrial park in Western Ukraine. A helicopter assault on an airport outside of Kiev, close in. Okay, so, the war, the war started. And uh, you know, many people ask me, what was the thinking in Kiev before the war? Sometimes, okay, why didn't you prepare or were you prepared, depending on the angle and what the person knows about the run-up to the war. Uh, I will try to explain, um, you know, what was the view, let's say, within the establishment. So we were talking to the MPs, to friends high up in the military. I mean, we are relatively well integrated, me and my wife, with, with the people who can run things in the country. So the thinking was uh, approximately like this. Uh, everyone understood the Russians were up to something and they, they're gonna attack. Th there was no doubt that like nothing's gonna happen, this is gonna pass, we knew something would be done. Uh, we also knew they had about 150,000 troops at the border and we knew this was not enough to capture Ukraine. Uh, we knew that this would probably not be enough to beat the armed forces of Ukraine. Actually, we turned out not just right, but even uh, relatively pessimistic, because they did worse than we expected them to do. Uh, what we did not know was that Mr. Putin <laughs> did not know this. So he operated on an entirely different assumptions. We thought, okay, we, given these numbers, given, given these facts, he will surely not try to invade the whole country and see his forces beaten back. He will try to do something localized, something in Donbass. And that was kind of what more or less everyone expected in Kyiv. So it wasn't like we were entirely unprepared. We were expecting something to happen in and around Donbass. Maybe he would try to recapture the whole region. Maybe he would try to do something else, but we did not expect the all-out invasion because numerically all our military analysts were saying, okay, they don't have enough forces to beat us. Definitely they don't have enough troops to occupy Ukraine. 150,000 is not that much. Now, Mr. Putin at the same time, as we know now, was operating under the assumption that he would not have to fight anyone, that he was loved. For some reason, he thought he was loved by a large chunk of Ukrainian population, that he would have support. When his troops were coming towards Kyiv, I mean, we found parade uniforms in the vehicles that were burned in those columns they were moving by. So they were coming in columns. They were not coming in combat, uh, you know, pro properly ready for combat. They were moving rapidly by the roads towards Kyiv. They've tried to land, as was said in this video, to drop paratroops in the airport near Kiev to try to capture it. For all accounts, it looks like they were trying to repeat what they did 
many years ago in Czechoslovakia, in 1968, when they suppressed the Prague Spring. That's the same pattern. So back then, Warsaw Pact troops invaded Czechoslovakia by the roads. Paratroopers were dropped into the airport near Prague. In one day, the whole country was occupied, but Czechoslovakia did not resist. Here, the situation was kind of different, and uh, Mr. Putin deeply miscalculated. Why, why it happened is interesting. It seems like he, first of all, he created this kind of class of pro-Russian politicians in Ukraine whom he sponsored and who really grew very, very rich of Russian money. And of course, they were telling him what he wanted to hear, that they were very successful, they were successfully you know, infiltrating all areas of Ukrainian states, they had a lot of influence, they were popular, anything he wanted to hear for his money. Uh, and he believed them, and he believed them so much that he started punishing his own intelligence for reporting the truth to him, which was that he wasn't loved. And then his intelligence started lying to him because, I mean, why get punished when you can also get promoted by presenting some fiction? And then he ended up with this crazy picture in his head and he ordered the invasion. And, well, let's get through the brief timeline. So the initial invasion was mostly beaten back by April. So they invaded in... I believe four or five directions, three directions from the north towards Kiev, one in the south from Crimea, and that was the only one where they succeeded, and one in the east towards Kharkiv. So by April, they retreated from Kiev. They were beaten near Kharkiv. They couldn't manage to capture the town. And the only area where they succeeded, where they managed to actually break through Ukrainian troops, was the south. They've captured one administrative center, Kherson, and uh, they've surrounded Mariupol, a big city on the coast of Azov Sea. They've constructed a land bridge uh, to Crimea. And essentially, that was the only military success that they had. Everywhere else, they were beaten and they had to retreat. So uh, after April, and there were peace, ne peace negotiations conducted back then in Istanbul. They failed. And uh, then the war turned positional for several months. Uh, then we kind of had this glimmer of cope when we retook, we beat them back from Kharkiv, pushed them more from Kharkiv, and we retook Kherson. That was autumn 2022. Uh, the war then again became positional until the late spring of last year, and a major Ukrainian counteroffensive was being prepared. And as you know, that one... Uh, I mean, you, you can't call it unsuccessful, actually. Our troops really pushed them in some areas. But by that time, the Russians were so dug in in the areas where they were present that this was not enough to break the stalemate and to drive them out of Ukraine for good. So by winter, by now, we are in a stalemate situation. Right? So we've pushed them, but we didn't manage to drive them out. And they don't have enough forces to drive us out either to, to win. So as of now, it's a stalemate. So where are we now? Uh, I'll, you know, the, 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 this can probably be a lecture in itself, right? So I'll, I'll try to just give you glimpses of the picture of what's going on now. First of all, and I'll start with something optimistic. Clearly, there are certain signs of Russia being exhausted. It's not like uh, fighting a very large war for two years does not take its toll on them. It does. It does. They're not invincible and their resources are not endless. So for the first time in October, the polls conducted by independent pollsters in Russia have shown that there is more support for peace talks there than the, for the continuation of the war. It's 48 for peace talks versus 39 for continuing the war for the first time. Before that, it was different all the time. Again, how much you can trust Russian polls? Not much. It's an authoritarian system. It's deeply problematic. But at least it's some glimpse into what's going on in the minds of the people there. And secondly, we know for sure that they really, really don't like to be mobilized and sent to fight in Ukraine. They really don't want it. So a third of the population very, has very strong feelings about them, and more than half don't support any kind of mobilization measures. They really didn't take kindly to it. Uh, which is why, actually, if you look at the news closely now, you'll see a lot of very strange mercenaries in the Russian army now. Nepalese, Somalians, 
Cubans, or all kinds of people recruited all over the world. They're trying to plug the gaps in their ranks by literally anyone they can find. So uh, nearly half of liquid assets that they have in their national wealth fund, what hasn't been frozen in their assets, they've already spent. So they're halfway down. The budget revenues that they have from oil and gas are down almost 40% in 2023 versus 2022, and are down by sizable chunk, 16%, against the pre-war levels. So they, if are sanctions working? Are they losing money? Yes, they are. It's not true that the sanctions did not have any impact on them. The revenues of their oil and gas producers, again, we're talking about the backbone of their economy. Russia is literally built around oil and gas sector. That, that's, that's what's holding it together. It's getting pummeled, really. Moreover, and again returning to sanctions, uh, their economy is essentially degrading as we speak. That's what's going on. They've lost access to capital, to know-how, but even to technologies, even to tech. Even that, they don't have enough. And my favorite example is what's going on in the civil aviation. So uh, in 2023, compared to the year before, the malfunctions in their aircrafts grew by 200%. The total flight hours are down by two-thirds. Literally, the sector is collapsing. Just a few days ago, a Russian plane fell in Afghanistan because two of its engines went out. They don't have enough you know, details that they used to get from the West. They don't have the tech. They don't get proper maintenance. And aviation is not the only example. Literally, all sectors of their economy are feeling it. And they know it. They know that their economy is degrading under their own feet. So, Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is deeply hurt by the invasion. You can't deny that. So GDP is a quarter lower than it was pre-war. Ukraine fully depends on allied support. That is also true. It cannot fight on its own. So its budget deficit is almost, it's a more than a quarter of GDP. No country can support itself on its own like that. So it relies financially on Western support, which is why this voting in US Congress and Senate that everyone's talking about is so important. But it also relies militarily on Western support because, again, the army mostly fights with Western weapons now and Western-supplied ammunition. Uh, as of now, plans for 2024 on both sides are uncertain, let's say. Well, for Russia, they were always uncertain. I mean, the goals that they proclaim for the war don't really adopt and they're strange. Some, some kind of denazification, some kind of demilitarization, what exactly that means, no one knows. can be interpreted however you like it. Ukraine was more clear on its goals, but after the stalemate ensued with the counteroffensive, no new clear strategy was announced yet. And then we are at the end of political cycle in both countries. So Putin has elections. They're scheduled for March. Of course, he will be re-elected. You can't even call that elections, frankly speaking. But it's a kind of vote of support for them. So in a very strange mind of former Soviet officials turned dictators, you kind of gauge how people like you from how many of them come to elect you when you're the only candidate. So that, that's how it works in those countries. And that's what Russian elites will be looking at. So until March, they, in March, they will be looking on what happens during his election as a kind of way to gauge how supportive the population is of Putin and his policies. Uh, which means that until March, he is unlikely to do anything. He will literally try to keep it as you know, as controlled and as tight as possible to avoid any unpleasant surprises during the elections. And then our own president's constitutional term is running out in May. So political cycles ending in both countries. Now, this is rather speculative on my part, and I'm, uh, the, these scenarios that I'm showing you, they are rather not a result of very deep analysis, but more let's say, a measure of what objectively can happen and what objectively is very unlikely to happen. Now, what is unlikely to happen is that either side has a major military breakthrough in 2024. Why? Ukraine needs to renew uh, after the counteroffensive last year. So literally everyone is talking about turning to some kind of active defense. It hasn't yet been announced by active policy, but that's both what military analysts within Ukraine say, 
and both what the allies are saying. So we need, we need to turn to active defense. Russia uh, is actually running out of manpower. Uh, they do have problems filling up the gaps in their ranks. And the way they are fighting, these gaps are you know, constantly growing. So that's why the mercenaries, the rumors, very un unverified numbers that I've heard, is that they were paying up to $20,000 immediately to enlist people into their private military corporations now, which was several months ago 5000 so they, they are rapidly running out of people who are suicidal enough to go and die in Ukraine. And uh, given Putin's election in March, even if he tries to fill that gap by forced mobilization of Russians, so he tried to take hundreds of thousands of more people from Russia and force them into the army, uh, he cannot start doing that until he gets reelected. So that cannot start until March. If it starts later, these troops will not be ready, will not go through the training cycle until the end of 2024. Meaning in 2024, they will not have the forces to do anything serious in Ukraine. So that leaves us with only two possibilities. Either the attrition of war will continue all year, what we're seeing right now, more or less, or we will get to some kind of ceasefire in 2024. That, that's just what objectively is possible. This thing, very unlikely. But let's not just dwell on the war, because I don't think the story of Ukraine is just about the war, and of Russia, for that matter, and for the whole, the whole region, right? Because as you probably some can summarize by the end of my lecture, it's not just about Ukraine. The, the, the picture is actually bigger than just Ukraine. So um, there is a kind of positive scenario of where, how this can go, how we can make a victory out of this, let's say, and what sh we should aim for in the region. And I'm not talking about just Ukrainians, because this is as much about Ukraine as about our Western allies, as about the US, as about the EU. So there are two major venues of opportunity to turn the whole thing around and to both you know, rise Ukraine up develop it to the less same level that its neighbors are, to strengthen the eastern flank of the Western world in Europe, and to, you know, to change this dynamics. So the first is the reconstruction, right? We know that hundreds of billions will be required to repair the damage that was done to Ukraine by Russia. But it's not just about repairing damage. This is about starting anew. If done correctly, that such a huge capital injection can kickstart proper, sustainable, high rates of economic growth that can close this. Let me return again to this slide of the problem that we're dealing with. This, this gap, right? Get Ukraine to be as developed as Poland and consequently strong enough to actually serve as a bulwark on the Eastern Front. Now, uh, of course, we can't mention, <laughs> can't miss to mention who has to pay for that, and I firmly believe that it has to be Russia, and uh, not the Western taxpayer, Russia. And for that, uh, if they refuse to pay, which is highly likely because that's their style throughout history, uh, there are 300 billion of Russian central bank assets frozen in the Western financial system. So if Russia does not pay, then that's what should be used to restore Ukraine, plain and simple. And second process, which will be happening simultaneously and which potentially can be done by 2030, is the EU accession. And not just of Ukraine, because Moldova, our smaller neighbor to the southwest, is also kind of part of the same system and the same scheme. So it's the EU accession, and the EU accession played a huge role in this mi economic miracle that happened in Eastern Europe. Because these post-communist countries were you know, given a very clear goal, uh, a carrot, and a stick, so you don't, you don't change, you don't rise up to our standards, you don't get to into our club. And this essentially what drove their development, and this is what drove this economic miracle that I've shown you and their success, and why they're not being attacked by Russia now. Now, of course, this all hinges on one thing. 
And this means the war has to end somehow, some way. And then there have to be a credible security arrangement that would deter any other war. Now, sometimes we talk about NATO membership for Ukraine, but that's not necessarily it. It can be something like a neutral peacekeeping force on the contact line between the two forces, a strong Ukrainian military. Maybe that would just, just that would be enough to deter further aggression. Maybe some kind of uh, no-flying zone over, let's say, western half of the country, guaranteed by NATO. Maybe some other arrangements. So th these things are discussed among experts, but they can be done. They are feasible. It's not something from outer space. It's, it just takes a will and uh, you know, a certain willingness to, uh, to make them happen. Now, what is at stake here? Why is this important? So this, this, this is region, now I admit taken randomly from the internet. Uh, this is Eurasia, right? Uh, and we're standing at the wiser center for Eurasia and Europe, so very fittingly so. Uh, this whole region is, mm, let's say, both the heartland, the heart of the old world, right? That's the core of the whole Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, this region houses a large, large chunk of world's natural resources, particularly this place here called Siberia. Uh, this, uh, this is probably the second strongest nation in the what we call authoritarian camp of nations now, right? After this, after China. So the fate of all this thing here, to a large extent, is being decided here in Ukraine. So that's what's at stake. It's not just about one mid-sized Eastern European nation. It's about one of the most important regions in the world. And ultimately, it's about where the world will head. That's what is at stake in Ukraine. And uh, not just now, not just immediately in the war, but also in this process. So if this succeeds, as described here, Chances are that this theory of Russia, where it can democratize and move here to the West, turns out true. If this fails, well, chances are we will, you know, again and again speak about this ancient empire menacing democratic nations from the East. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, no questions, please. I'm really tired of just talking to myself. I hate such long monologues. <laughs> so uh, we have time for, for questions. And uh, if you can raise your hand, and um, we'll go from there. We have two different people taking Okay. So rules of engagement, please. Uh, there's a large crowd, lots of questions, I'm certain. So please. Uh, Refrain from long commentaries, uh, brief question, and if you can say your name and if you're affiliated with the university, especially if you're a student, your major. Good evening. I'm Stanley Weber. I'm a resident of Ann Arbor, and I'm not a student, long time non-student. Non um, what is the thinking in the, uh, with Zelensky and the government in terms of a possible settlement, a peace settlement, and beyond that, what is the thinking of the government in terms of coming into NATO um, or the EU? And thirdly, would gi be giving up on the coming into NATO, sp specifically NATO, be a good strategy to try and achieve a settlement this year or next. In other words, Ukraine gives up the idea of ever coming into NATO. And would that be a good thing to do to pursue in order to try and get a settlement this year or next? Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a very tough question in Ukraine. I can assure that everyone, literally everyone, wants to be both in NATO and the EU. So that's a universal push among all political factions, in the government and among the population. So on the settlement issue, uh, let's put it this way. Officially, the position now is pretty hardline, and you know that. We're not conducting negotiations with Russia, and uh, we really want, we want them out of the country. We want to throw them out. Uh, how will that position evolve, let's say, throughout 2024? I don't know, and I would not like to speculate on that. So we will see. As of now, we're not talking. Maybe you don't know, but what do you hear? What do you hear within the, the chambers of the government? What do you hear on these questions? The questions are Look, it's a constant discussion, of course. I mean, it's the largest war in Europe since World War II. Of course, people are constantly discussing how to get out of it. But I would really not want to speculate on this. This is a very sensitive topic in Ukraine. So as of now, we're taking a pretty hardline stance. What will happen next depends. We will see. Up to 10. <laughs> Hi there, thank you. Um, I'm Eric Erke, I'm a, also a local Ann Arbor resident. So, um, it, you know, it, it seems to me that one of the key problems for Ukraine, let's forget about the war for now, integrating with Europe is the lack of all the infrastructure that it takes to be a modern capitalistic democratic nation, right? So you talk about the, the corruption, um, the, the weak kind of systems in place that have been fostered by Russia. Um, how do you build that up? That is difficult. You need a lot of university students. You need a lot of people who understand organization. You need a lot of government structure in order to make sure that it does not devolve into corruption. All the investment is lost, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, that seems to be like the critical problem. Well, it certainly is. I mean, oh, okay, please, please. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I'll remember it, don't worry. Uh, I'm Emerson Krauss. I'm a student of political science and a researcher here at the university. And as uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, Zelensky's term ends this spring, I was wondering how much, uh, how important is he in this movement uh, and how much is like tied to his face and would a change in leadership uh, change Ukraine's potential future? Well, again, I mean, the term runs out constitutionally, and then there is certain vagueness of what happens, because there have to be elections, but it's wartime. During wartime, elections generally are not held. So, and again, I wouldn't, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, definitely, to speculate on what the arrangement will be. I'm just saying that we are at the end of a political cycle. Currently, he is the leader and commander-in-chief, so for sure his role is critical. That's it. Uh, to, to your question, sir. Uh, yes, for sure, uh, that's a big, this institutional underdevelopment, let's call it that way, is a big chunk of the problem. Uh, no less big as Russia and its presence. Uh, fortunately, we actually know pretty well what to do about it, because if you think that Poland 30 years ago was some kind of beacon of hope and a demo fu fully functioning market economy and democracy, well, it was not. I assure you. And they did a lot, a lot of work throughout the 30 years to get where they are now. And now they are essentially on the steps of reaching the Western European level of development. Not exactly there yet, but they're close and they will do that. Same can be done in Ukraine. I'm not saying it's easy, it's not. But it's a project that is feasible and that we know what to do about. We know how to do structural reforms in an Eastern European countries to turn it into something more successful than what it is. Hi, I'm Tommy, I'm a master's student here. And I was just wondering if there was any plan for Ukraine to repay the United States and other Western nations for the weapons which had been given to Ukraine and which will of course be given to Ukraine because after World War II, Britain did repay the United States for all the aid that America delivered to Britain through Lend-Lease. So I was just wondering if there's any plan in place there because obviously the politics in this country are also changing. There are many Americans who do want to see 
a return on this investment more directly and within the near future. Okay, well, you, uh, one more question or do I answer that? Okay. Thank you very much for an incredible presentation. And I wanted to note that um, what Ukraine has done during wartime in actually increasing transparency and accountability in the economic sector and in the judicial sector is something that we haven't seen before. The increase of the rule of law during wartime. That's a structural and institutional coup d'etat from my perspective. I was wondering if you could speak to that. How has Ukraine been able to strengthen its institutions under wartime circumstances? And also just a comment from my gentleman neighbor behind me. I used to be the NATO representative to Ukraine for some long time um, and worked for the US government in Ukraine prior to that. Um, I would like to know that institutions, structures, law were being developed uh, very democratically the first 10 years. And on that foundation, um, we then begin the story of 2014 and Russia's involvement thereafter. So there was a great deal to build upon and perhaps now to resurrect. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, OK, I'll, I'll start with that now. In general, what's happening institutionally in Ukraine is kind of a continuation of what was happening before. Was. So we have a pretty elaborate plans on reforms on all fronts, and that's what uh, the EU knows these plans. I mean, they are pretty well aligned with the international partners, and that's what's uh, being implemented. Sometimes more successfully, sometimes less successfully. Again, I would not like to downplay the level of damage that Ukraine has suffered throughout the war. War is not a very good thing for life development or anything. And it's uh, not just material, not just lives, but it's also institutional. So, for example, by necessity, the security of apparatus in Ukraine is very strengthened. It's not uh, the best out there, and that's where large chunks of corruption were present. So these are being strengthened, of course, by the war. And this creates problems and tensions, which we then have to sort out. So some periodic scandals, businesses being unhappy, you know, there is that, and we should not be hiding from that. Uh, that will continue for as long as the war is continuing, because ultimately the root cause of that is not some kind of conspiracy within the Ukrainian system, but simply the pressure that the war is putting in the country. Like, for God's sake, we have the borders closed, for most men cannot simply get in and out of the country, so basic freedoms are violated. Again, because of the war, that's what's driving this whole thing. But I'm, that doesn't mean it's good for the country's development. Then again, I mean, we return to what I've said. We do have an understanding of how to get the country from where it is now to something much more developed, if given the chance, of, if, given, if the circumstances are right. So that's what I'm talking about. When we're talking about Ukraine being reconstructed and being coming closer towards the EU, we have the roadmap for that. We just need the other players to play along with us. That's how it is. Concerning your question, sir, the aid to Ukraine is being provided, broadly speaking, on two venues. So one of it is, let's say, called grant, right? It's freely provided. The other is debt. It's uh, essentially cheap loans in one form or the other. So by, by definition, the return of this aid is kind of writ, you know, written down into it. The debt will be repaid, of course. The grants, well, I'm, I don't, I'm not familiar with the arrangement about should they be returned or not. I guess this can be discussed, but frankly speaking, uh, look, uh, most of it, uh, if we're, especially if we're talking about this, um, the non-financial component, it's not money. It's essentially tanks lying in your warehouse that you give to us and order at the same time uh, from your industry the new ones. You're replacing your older weak weapons, armor, ammunition. Not fast enough. But not fast enough. Maybe, I mean, it's actually, it, it's then difference by in some industries fast enough and in some industries faster than necessary and some uh, not, not fast enough. It depends. But generally speaking, that's the pattern, right? So you're uh, dumping what you have in the warehouse and you're filling it with new stock of weapons and ammunition. That's how it's going.
Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so this is my husband. <laughs> and in our couple, he's an optimist. <laughs> and um, He's a pessimist. You're no, the optimist. No, he, in our couple, he is optimist. Oh. Uh, so, um, but I, uh, we can disagree. Despite of the fact that we live together, we can disagree. And I will disagree at home <laughs> about the number of reforms that Ukraine has done. I used to work for the World Bank and for the government of Ukraine, and I'm not speaking from the government of Ukraine. But I think that Ukraine has done an enormous number of reforms, and many of them were successful, including the reforms that you have been doing, like pension reform. And it's amazing to see that there is this war and there is so much desperacy. But pensioners, 12 million of pensioners, still get pensions that you actually you know, were you are constructing. We have done anti-corruption uh, infrastructure that perhaps is not perfect, but which made our uh, institutions and politics very transparent and is very, very helpful uh, in terms of actually strengthening the country. We have done uh, energy reforms. We have done many, many of them. And when I was listening to you, unfortunately, I didn't hear that. And I just want you to say what you usually tell me at home. Because, you know, this person never gives up. Even, even you know, he works now for Moldovan government and he works for Ukrainian government. And if there are challenges, he is the one who tells me there is another way. And he sits at home and gets calls from around Eastern Europe for the people to consult, for the people to learn. And I want you to tell what is the optimism there, what actually you are doing for the country. And actually, another fact, this guy used to have a green card, and he denied it to come to Ukraine. He's an admired person. Like, what is the opt? Why are you doing all of this for 10 years? And why do you want to stay in this politics? Why you don't want to leave the country? What is the optimism there? Thank you. No, and thank I you. That's my, that's my uh, wife, Chester. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I want to say that this, uh, she's not only the wife of Pablo, this is Yulia Mendel, our distinguished fellow, who was press secretary of President Zelensky. So you can see also that the way that you can twist a little bit, <laughs> re reframe a discussion is very uh, much appreciated. So I don't know if you want to respond before we take one last question. I Oops. think that the, the, the public would appreciate a response to Yulia before we go to one more question. Well, it's, the response is very simple. Of course, I believe in Ukraine. I, mean, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I did not. And again, yes, that is quite true. She's quite right. Ukraine did do a lot. And why I'm saying the results were mixed is what, because when you waste 30 years before, you have to do much, much more to uh, catch up. And I'd say we were halfway there when the Russians invaded. And we need to continue because we need to get there because that's ultimately the way to beat back them, to beat their invasion, you know? And to show an example to them, to, to those Russians inside their system who probably don't want to live like they live now. So uh, I do believe in it. I, do be, I believe we will win ultimately, frankly speaking. I believe this positive scenario I'm describing will happen one way or the other. I don't believe it will come easy, I don't believe it will come fast, but I believe that ultimately this will be the victory of the free world and not, not the other side. Hi, Dobro Vechera. Dobro Vechera. I'm from Kyiv, just as you, my name is Oleg. Um, I'm studying urban technology. I'm curious, what is your road plan at this point of how the reconstruction of Ukraine is gonna work, especially for people like me in my field of study? Well, thank you, that, that, that would be like another lecture. <laughs> okay, well. And we have one more question, sorry, to just put uh, just, together. Okay, let's do it. It'll be a separate lecture. Michael Washura, I'm LSA class 2005. Um, my question is, what did we get wrong about Putin up until February 24th, 2022? Uh, just to preface this, I was in Moscow on February 23rd, 2022. And essentially everyone around me, um, you know, anti-Putin, pro-Putin, all expected there to be no invasion. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine, lived there for a total of three years. And everyone who I knew in Odessa, um, in Kiev, Berezanka, um, essentially none of them expected the invasion. I remember statements from Zelensky, from Danilov, um, you know, as late as mid-February 2022, um, you know, saying there's nothing to worry about. 
there was obviously something to worry about. What did we get wrong about Putin up until February 24th, 2022? Look, I think what we as humanity keep getting wrong periodically in general is how crazy things can go when we get someone in charge get out of hand, right? So we expected him to act rationally, right? And it seems like people in Moscow you were talking to expected him to act rationally and the rational action was not to invade or if he to invade at least do it some kind of hybrid limited fashion how he did it before and he decided to throw you know a wrench in the machine uh, and uh, i think the lesson for all of us here is that you know crazy leadership is dangerous we should not we should not get things out of hand democracy is there for a reason you know <laughs> it's good it's actually good it, that's what keeps us from crazy things happening right if you get rid of democracy you end up where russians ended up you know being taken into the army thrown into a meat grinder in ukraine and dying there which most of them obviously don't want right i mean it's clear so that that that's i think the lesson here uh, and concerning the expectations, as I've said, in Kyiv we generally expected something to happen. No one really expected this to happen on such a scale because this was clearly irrational. And the results were irrational, that's true. I mean, he, he, he's, he's, the army that was standing on Ukraine's borders, gathering there before the invasion, is mostly dead now. Most of these people are dead. They died there in the first year. I mean, it's stuffed by new people now. So th this, th there was nothing rational about his actions. They were pretty stupid. They were done on very, very wrong intelligence. But that, you know, when you have one person in charge, when the, all the controls and checks and balances on a person are taken away, and then that person goes crazy, that's what you get, right? So that's the lesson, don't do that. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, as, for, uh, sir, as for your question about the reconstruction, so again, just to give you some general hints, with a very, very large participation of various international organizations and the US government and the European governments, a big, big elaborate digital system of reconstruction management is being constructed, so very, uh, transparent and some of it is already available it's already online it's called dream d-r-e-a-m you can google it some of it is available as websites and you can see it lists the projects it lists the details it lists the rules that's all in the works the reconstruction has actually already started so several billion dollars already went in last year into various projects around the country rebuilding them my personal view of the reconstruction and what i was helping the government to form a bit is uh, that we should look at it broader than just simply rebuilding broken infrastructure or destroyed homes. The whole point is uh, reviving the economy and relaunching it on a new basis. And to me, reconstruction is actually more about getting private Western capital in than about the public funding of whatever infrastructure happens. That is too, too is necessary, but I'm not focused on that because that does not bring change. What can bring change to Ukraine is 20 international corporations coming in simultaneously with billions of dollars of investment and setting up home there and dominating the major industries because that will totally change the economy. And the changed economy will totally change the whole political and social dynamic in Ukraine because ultimately, ultimately where the root of cause of domestic problem comes from, if we take Russia out of the equation for a moment, is this vicious circle of corrupt oligarchy capturing the political power and then using it to keep the system which they profit from. And if that's broken, if instead of these guys there are normal international corporations in place, and it's over, then we have essentially free reign to do reforms and join the EU. It, it, it was just a comment because I lived in Slovakia from 2001 to 2004 and watched their NATO ascendancy and joining the EU. And I can guarantee you that the corruption level in Slovakia was very high at the time. You know, it's one thing to be shaken down by policemen at the corner. It's another thing to think of Vladimir Mechiar and his limestone pits. So um, I, when they joined NATO, it actually had the net effect. It was imperative that, um, that Slovakia join if they wanted to because their border with you was completely open, even though you saw the, the fence and the barbed wire. 
and there were uh, Al Qaeda terrorists infiltrating into Austria through Slovakia uh, at the end of 2001. So um, it was very important because all the countries in NATO were porous as long as that border was open. But then when that happened, that basically sealed you off from the West. I mean, in the sense that I, I never went to Ukraine. I went to every other neighboring country many times, but it just wasn't travel that the U.S. would. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. it was different yeah. system, different border. Yeah. Mm, that's so uh, we, we fail to see that here. I mean, I was stunned when I went there to realize that this country, which was so Western in my eyes, was still very communist in many ways. And they weren't even as isolated as you were. So I commend Ukraine on the progress that they've made. It's unfortunate that the NATO situation is so fragile uh, because it, it is a, the, the process for that, as was cited earlier, is a, a really wonderful uh, introduction to what you have to do to be part of the European community uh, and to, be, to get rid of corruption and to develop rule of law. And without that process, jumping into the EU becomes much harder. For sure. And uh, it shouldn't happen. I mean, it, the, the whole point of EU accession is to kind of change the system until it's ready to join and then let it join. And the join is the carrot, which you have to earn, not just some you know, undeserved boon. Well, um, we have many more uh, events, lectures, uh, exhibits to come on Ukraine. Uh, we want to thank you very much for taking the time to explaining everything. <laughs> and I want to make sure that everyone grabs a calendar from uh, the Wiser Centers on your way out if you haven't already. And please come to those two free films and especially to Yelia Mendel's uh, distinguished lecture on February 19th. Monday at Rackham. So thank you again. Thank and you. we hope to see you soon. <laughs>